So I'm Becky Gowland and I specialise in human skeletal remains. Um, for me, the skeleton is the most important part um, or form of archaeological evidence. Uh, I think skeletons have been overlooked for quite a while in archaeology. I think because people thought they were a bit boring or just didn't really tell us anything about how people lived in the past. For me, human skeletal remains are the most direct form of archaeological evidence, uh, the most direct evidence uh, for what people were doing in the past, um, and then the most emotive form of archaeological evidence as well. As archaeologists, what we're trying to do is find out about how people lived, how they interacted, uh, uh, what their occupations and activities were, and the skeleton um, is, is perfect for telling us all about all these different aspects. So one of the main themes that I've been looking at uh, through, probably throughout the last 10 years is um, childhood in the past. Um, children have tended to be overlooked in archaeology, um, seen as sort of passive and dependent and not really very important. So the first thing we do when we're looking at the remains of children is to figure out how old they were when they died. So to do this uh, we look at dental development, that's the most accurate method because even if the child is unwell or stressed in any way the teeth will still continue growing at a regular rate. So dental development is a very accurate indicator of chronological age. We can't estimate the sex of children, which is a shame, and that's because before puberty there aren't sufficient skeletal differences uh, between boys and girls. So we can't estimate sex, so that's one limitation. What's really important about the remains of children is looking at indicators of poor health. So while the child is growing, that's when um, they're particularly sensitive to external stressors, uh, such as poor diet, um, infectious disease and obviously children in the past may have had a high mortality rate as a consequence of these things. So we look at particular skeletal lesions um, in the orbits of the skull or on the teeth and these retain a record of any um, childhood health onslaughts as they've been growing up and that record is actually retained into adults as well. So when I'm looking at childhood health in the past, I'm not restricted to looking at the skeletal remains of children. I can also look at the adults and see how their health was when they were growing up. Most of my research into, ch into childhood in the past has been focused on the Roman period. So that's where most of my research has been done. But a project that I'm working on at the moment is much more recent. It's uh, looking at children from the Industrial Revolution in the north of England. And this is quite an interesting period because obviously we have a lot of historical evidence for the Industrial Revolution. But what we want to see is uh, the direct evidence from the remains of the children. So there's a lot written about child health during this period, but obviously it was, it's quite often written by people that had their own political agenda, whether they were pushing for reform in child labour um, laws. So what we want to do is look at the skeletal remains and to see if we can see any evidence of the poor health that they're suggesting in their historical documents. And actually what we're finding is that there's an awful lot of evidence for things like rickets in the past. And this is something that's alluded to in these historical documents where they refer to the children being sort of knock-kneed and bow-legged um, and, and deformed in some kind of way. So we are seeing uh, evidence for, for knock-kneed children. Um, we're also seeing evidence for a lot of malnutrition as well. Um, we're seeing evidence for different types of uh, infectious diseases that obviously the children had for some time. It's only when you ha live with a, a disease for some period of time that it actually affects the bones. One of the, the things that we've been working on uh, and we've been running for the last seven years is a course for, that's aimed at forensic practitioners and in particular the police and crime scene investigators and scientific support managers working for the police. And what we're trying to do is um, teach them some of their techniques of body location, so using methods like geophysics um, and also excavation techniques. Techniques of excavation are ideally suited to a crime scene because as archaeologists we're really fantastic at um, excavating something but recording precisely uh, three-dimensionally where everything is. So that works very well and transfers very well to a crime scene scenario.
Um, so we've been teaching those techniques to the police specifically in relation to excavating bodies. Uh, we've also been teaching them about the anthropological side of things as well. So once we have the body and it's in the lab, what can we tell them about the skeleton? What are the potentials of the methods, but also what are the limitations? Uh, because I think with programmes like CSI and Waking the Dead, there are unrealistic expectations sometimes about the accuracy of some of the methods and, and the detail of, of the information that we can get from decomposed or skeletal remains. With students, the first thing we teach them before they look at any real human skeletal remains is that these are the remains of once living people and they need to be treated with respect. So with the first year students, what we tend to do is teach them initially with cast skeletons, so replica skeletons, just until they get used to handling them, um, because they are a finite resource as well. Once they've had a few practical sessions with the cast skeletons and they're, they're happy working with this material, they know how to handle this material, then um, in the second and third years we move on to real human skeletal remains. Well, I think when you're teaching human remains, I think you've got a little bit of an advantage in that people are really drawn to them um, and they excite students and it's a very sort of hands-on uh, mode of teaching as well. So they get to handle human remains, they get to apply techniques to real human remains. And so it, it has that level of engagement almost immediately uh, that perhaps some other su subjects struggle with a little bit more. Um, so what we do is we have them in the lab, uh, we'll, we'll do lectures followed by lab sessions. Um, so they get taught about their techniques in a lecture and then they apply them uh, in the lab afterwards. A lot of students want to do research on human remains at both an undergraduate level and a postgraduate level and obviously we give them the opportunity to do that as well. We've got a lot of collections of skeletal remains in the department and these have been used for all kinds of projects. So I've supervised undergraduate research that's been looking at medieval trauma, so that's been looking at one of our collections and radiographing the bones using our facilities and trying to figure out the different patterns of types of trauma within that collection. We've had projects that have been looking at health stress in children, looking at things like um, enamel hyperplasia, which are lines in the enamel that form as the teeth are developing and they occur if the child is unwell or, or ill. So we've had students doing projects like that at an undergraduate level. At a postgraduate level, the projects can be a little bit more involved, the students can work on them more intensively, and also they're students who've had a lot of training if they've done our MSc in paleopathology. So those projects can be a little bit more involved. So they've, uh, they've involved either isotope analysis uh, with Janet or Andrew, or they've been focusing on a particular aspect of paleopathology, like joint disease within uh, different collections.